Right. Welcome to week nine. Hopefully you had a somewhat restful break. Um, it was an eventful week for me, so that's all good. Yeah, yeah, I got a new job. I'm done. So, done. So it's all good. Stress in my life has dissipated dramatically. Watching the look on my manager's face and I giving him two weeks notice was glorious. Anyways, um, hey guys, it is time to stop talking. Thank you. If I can't hear myself, nobody else can either. So, starting week nine, um, it's as if we're doing a hard reset on the course. The way we design this course is weeks one to eight is one kind of material. Weeks nine to the end is a different kind of material. It's almost like two courses glued together in the middle. Good news. Everything you learned for the first half, except for having how to read a diagram, you don't need to try to remember. I'm sure that for 80% of this group, that or has already happened. I'm just going to, okay. I'm realistic. So what we are going to be diving into now is SQL. And SQL, a little bit of history, is a language, it's called Structured Query Language, thus SQL, it was developed by IBM in the 70s. It's been around a long time. Um, some people, you know, don't realize just how far back it goes. You will notice I pronounce it SQL, not SQL. It is an initialism, not an acronym. Otherwise, the company that developed it, we should be calling IBM. Just saying. Um, it is a pet peeve of mine. It always has been. And there is a reason why, historically, it was called SQL. People call it SQL. Because when IBM first came out with it, they called it SQL. S-E-Q-U-E-L. And that lasted a grand total of, I think, six months, and they got the shit suit out of them by a company in the UK. For patent infringement, uh, no, sorry, for copyright infringement, because they'd already had a database product called SQL. Therefore, IBM was like, cool, we'll just take the vowels out. New product. So, a lot of people call it SQL, it's actually SQL, whatever. Although it came out in the 70s, um, there are significantly newer versions, as you can see a whole litany of numbers there. Um, it has barely changed since I learned it in the 90s, early 90s. What each of the standards brings is new features that people want, but a lot of people don't use. Um, basically, put, there is a um, benchmark that they use to say that they have all the things a person could ever want. It's known as SQL 99. Uh, I guarantee. Since I've started working in 96, I've pretty much only used SQL 99 with a little bit of some of the newer peppered in features. Uh, we will not be touching any of these new features. There's just too much, not enough time. Um, like some of the new features included uh, XML, JSON, object oriented concepts. Uh, the database server you guys are going to be using to do the second half of the term actually supports object oriented database. You can actually have table inheritance. One table inherits another table. And then you can overload it. It's cool. We're not going to learn any of that. Uh, I'm just saying, it's got features. So those of you that got the textbook, whichever way you got that textbook, um, they tend to use SQL Server in 2019. That's the you know Microsoft product as the syntax in the book. And I've gone through and tried to clean up the slides as best as I can. Um, but there'll still be the odd one that has some weird syntax in it that may not work with what we're doing. We're using Postgres for demos and labs. I added a link at the bottom there. You guys can copy paste. It's probably the absolute best tutorial to do with Postgres I've ever seen. Um, not has nothing to do with the fact that it's called Postgres SQL tutorial. I've seen lots of SQL tutorials. This one just covers everything you could ever need, and then some. Like, I've used it to learn things myself that I didn't even know existed uh, until recently. 
Okay, so SQL is known as a data sub-language. Um, it is not a fully featured programming language, SQL itself. Um, it's a sub-language for creating and processing database data. It is ubiquitous. Yeah, for those of you that don't know what the word ubiquitous means, it means it's everywhere. If it's an enterprise class database and it doesn't go along the lines of saying, I am a no SQL database, guess what it has? SQL. Um, SQL programming is a critical skill. Uh, and let me uh, highlight a moment of my uh, not so proud life. I went through college. My, my database courses were in core level, for what would be for you guys, levels four, five, and six. And the entire time I was just skimming along, not really paying attention. I really liked SQL, so I did pretty good in that course. The other two courses I didn't do so good because I said to myself, I'll never work in database. First job out of college, database. Second job out of da college, database. Third job out of college, database. Fourth job for the last 23 years, database. New job, probably database again. They're still trying to decide what they're going to do with me. But that's okay. I got the job. That's all that counts. So SQL programming, and I really hate the phrase programming because it's really not programming, is a skill that really you should learn. Uh, this course will give you the basics of it. It'll introduce you to all the major pieces that you need that will cover 95% of what you need to do with a database. That last 5% covers like 80% of the SQL language. So, you know, it's like one of those 80-20 kind of situations, but more like 90-10, 95-5. Um, yeah, yeah, it's definitely an important skill to have. The way I'm gonna be doing going through these slides is I'll go through the slides, drop and You'll see me sit down. I'm actually going to basically type in code for you guys how it works. Um, SQL is actually broken down in multiple pieces. There's the DDL, which is used, which is data definition language. It's used for creating tables, relationships, and other structures. Um, essentially, what you want to think about it, this is the contractors that are building your house. They're going to put up walls, they put in the windows, that's about it. We have DML, Data Manipulation Language. It's used for querying, inserting, modifying, and deleting. That's what you use to decorate your house. So you're going to put in some furniture, you're going to paint the walls, that kind of thing. Uh, SQL PSM. Um, not a fan that they included that one in this slide. Basically put, that is only specific to certain database products, not all database products. Uh, transaction control language has to do with managing transactions. Uh, we will kind of glance at it on the way by during the last lecture. Um, it's not important to learn it now, but it's an important topic to know that exists. And DCL, data control language, is basically for security. So users, groups, permissions, that kind of thing. For this course, we're going to just do the first two. For those of you that have gone to YouTube and looked at my lectures, you'll see some lectures for a course called CST8250, 8250. It covers some DCL. So if you're curious about DCL, you can go dig around my old lectures. I did cover this material elsewhere. All right, a few things to know about SQL. SQL keywords are not case sensitive. In other words, you can type it uppercase, lowercase, mixed case, it doesn't care. Not like Java, which it really cares. Database objects may be case sensitive depending on what database engine you're working with. MySQL does not care. Postgres, which is the one you guys are going to be using, cares a lot. It was written for Unix, developed for Unix for years ported to Windows, and what's one of the very most important things you're ever going to learn about Unix and or Linux? It is annually retentive, case sensitive, and Postgres is also. 
Um, Oracle lies. It stores it whichever way you typed it, then it stores an uppercase version of the, the whatever object. So whenever, no matter what you're typing in, it compares it to the uppercase and then it shows you the one you had originally. So it just pretends to be case insensitive. Uh, SQL Server is case sensitive depending which code page you install it in. In other words, what language is installed on the server it's running on. If it's installed on a server that has a language that is not a Latinate language, often it will be case sensitive. If it's a Latinate language, it's often not case sensitive. Just figure that one out. Um, the command terminator is semicolon. Congratulations, folks. You're going to feel at home. But the thing is, if you're only ever running one command at a time, which is usually how what you do, you don't need the semicolon. It'll still work. Because most of the time, you're going to be running one command, then another command, then a third command. So, you know, um, if there's spaces in the table or column names, you need to escape it. Thus, why I tell you guys, don't ever put spaces in your object names. Use underscores, camel case, ugh, camel case if you have to. Sorry, I almost threw up when I said that, camel case. Um, because th there's no standard for the escape character. MySQL uses a backtick. Postgres, IBM, DB2, and Oracle use double quotes. Microsoft SQL Server uses square brackets. Therefore, if you want to write code that is cross-platform, don't use spaces. Otherwise, you've got to write special code saying, which server am I connecting to today? Oh, I need to escape my objects now. And then you make it do whatever it needs to do to make the, the magic happen. Um, yeah, just don't put spaces in object names. Okay, yeah. we're actually going to be covering this next week, this particular one slide with one purple line on it. <clears throat> However, you're going to see me run a command that looks like this several times today. So I figured I'd introduce you to it. Uh, as far as SQL goes, this is the closest to hello world. It's select star from whatever table you're trying to pull data from. It's basically saying, give me everything from this table without any filtering. Um, you'll, like I said, you'll see me run it in a bit. Okay. So the first half of the semester, you guys were learning the concepts of what a table is, columns, data types, that kind of thing. And the SQL keyword to make things in the database is create. And if you want to create a table, it's create table. And it creates tables. You have to include each column, uh, the name of the column, the data type, any optional constraints. The basic format is as follows. Uh, create table, give it a name, parentheses, list off your columns. Each column is comma delimited. In a minute, I'll show you guys actually a proper command. Um, There's a light there that keeps flickering. It's driving me nuts. That last one in the corner, you'll see it every couple of minutes, just lights and turns off. Um, constraints can be defined within the create table statement, or they can be done with an alter table. Um, we are not going to be going through in detail with every single command. The help page for the create table command on the Postgres documentation if you were to print it, it would be 16 pages long just for the create table command. Well, I'm going to show you guys the basics. If you need to know more, Google is your friend. Or even better, that tutorial page I gave you guys a link for will have everything you need in a nice self-contained spot. And it is specific to the database engine you're using, so that makes that much more useful. So when you create the table, you can add some constraints. So example of constraints are primary keys, foreign keys. Those are not words you haven't heard before. Uh, a null, not null, we discussed that already. A unique, check. That last one, the check constraint, is a little special because not all database servers support it. Um, MySQL doesn't support check at all. It sees the check keyword, it pretends, it sees it says, dude, I got gotcha. you, here's your check constraint. And then 
it just pretends it never even heard it. It's like a toddler. No, you're not allowed to do that. that that's okay, I'll do it anyways. Um, the default keyword, it's not technically a constraint, but you can set initial values, which is kind of cool. Oh, wow, it looks like shit now. Hmm, hang on, give me a second. Nope, not that. I promise it actually looks better when it's on a 1080p screen. I mean, on uh, not on a, the school projector. Let's go with that. Let's make it a little bit smaller. Save. And this one's going to be an absolute shit show, too. Let's go a little smaller. Oh, that's too small. Save. Come back here. Slideshow from the current slide. Yeah, I did this at like the last minute before I left home. So, okay. Here's an example of a create table statement with pretty much all the bits and pieces that you guys learned about last semester. The, you know, the data types and the columns. This one, if anybody looked at the slide deck before today, um, you'll notice that it looks a little bit different than this one because I literally today took the time to update it. So it actually used the same syntax as what you guys are using. So you've got create table. You got the name of the table. In this case, the table's called artist. You open up your parentheses and you have all your columns listed in there. And artist ID is an integer. It's not null. And there's stuff afterwards that is Postgres server specific and Oracle. Uh, I think it might even work for Microsoft SQL server. I'm not 100% sure. So it says generated always as identity also known as an auto-incrementing synthetic key. So it's auto-generate, you know, generated always, it's always generating a value, and it's an identity. Um, Postgres has a different type, it's called serial. It basically does the same thing. Um, it just, it's an integer that auto-increments. Uh, MySQL uses an actual keyword called auto-increment. Uh, Microsoft SQL Server has like five different kinds, take your pick. Whatever. Um, last name. Character varying 25, not null. The character varying 25, if you look at first name, suddenly says just varkar25. Postgres will accept both syntaxes. That's why I put it in the slide. You can either use varkar25, which will work everywhere, or Postgres's flavor of character varying. That's the same thing. Nationality, car30, null. Uh, here's a pro tip. If you don't include not null, it's always going to be null. So the default is allow null unless you tell it otherwise. No, you can skip the null keyword. Uh, date of birth is a date. Date deceased is a date. Then I've got a, for my first constraint. So it's constraint, constraint name, primary key with the field that is the primary key. Yes. It means it'll take up 30 characters always. No, it's a car. A var car is varying varying length string. That means that even if you do a var car 30, you put in the letter A, it'll occupy the letter, the space of one byte plus just like a couple of bits. A car 30 will always occupy 30. If you put in the letter A, it'll occupy 30 bytes. That's the difference. It's a fixed length, whether or not you put it in there. Nationality is actually stupid to do a car 30. I just kept the slides as close to the originals as we had. Just, eh? Or it probably should be a var car, maybe even a foreign key, which I'll show you guys on another slide in a moment. Um, so constraint, artist, primary key. In the primary key, we have uh, artist ID because you know we decided that's what our primary key is going to be. What's cool is if you define it that way, you can put in a comma delimited list of fields. So if you have a compound key, you could have gone artist ID comma last name. Uh, there's an example below where you've got a constraint for the, that they called it AK1, unique last name, first name. It's saying that 
the combination of last name and first name must be unique when you add the record. Um, it's a constraint. In other words, you can never have two artists with the same name. That's never happened. Ever. Here's a slightly longer version that has pretty much the rest of the crap in it that you'd expect to see. Um, here we have a default value at the end. So we're saying, you know, the description, it'll always, if it's not provided, it'll default to unknown, like literally unknown provenance. So if you added a record and you did not include a value for description, it would default to unknown provenance. Um, and the only big other change in this one is this piece down here, this last constraint. Remember last semester, we spent so much time talking about foreign keys. This is how you actually create the foreign key. So, you know, in MySQL Workbench, where you clicked on one table, then you clicked on the other table and you drew a line. This is the code that line would generate. So it's saying there's a constraint called artist foreign key. It's a foreign key. Artist ID, it's saying basically this artist ID right here. So foreign key, this artist ID references the artist table and that field in the artist table. On update, no action. On delete, no action. Okay. At this point, I'm going to po ask if anybody's noticed anything different about SQL compared to, you know, what you've been learning so far in other courses. No, it doesn't do any coding for you. Oh, the formatting is just, that's just uh, PowerPoint sh being shitty with it. Yeah. It, yeah, it's very similar to pseudocode. It's very English. Uh, once we start doing actual full fat queries, like starting next week, you'll realize that it is a very English-like language. Um, the reason for that is when SQL was originally created, and brace yourself, it was created not for programmers. It was created for managers. So managers could write their own queries. I mean, they, some of this was created for the programmers too, obviously, but this was written in, with less technical people in mind. I don't know what managers they experienced thinking that this would ever work for a manager, but <laughs> he's laughing. I have no respect for managers, even though, you know. Yeah, managers just want the numbers. They don't want to have to figure out how to get it themselves. It was written in such a way that it was understandable and quickly at a glance, you could see what everything was like constraint, work, PK, primary key, work ID, you know, constraint, work, alternate key, unique title, copy, constraint, artist, foreign key. It's a foreign key that uses the artist ID, which references the artist table, the artist ID column in it. Uh, the last two at the bottom on update, non delete, that deals with the whole um, referential integrity rules. Um, on update, if the primary key changes on one side, it'll automatically update itself for you. Uh, on delete, if you set, uh, set that instead of saying on delete, no action. So when you see no action, it says if you try to delete the parent, it'll stop it from being deleted if there's a child record. It's saying no action. You're not allowed to do this. Um, you have a couple of options. You can go set null, which sets the foreign key as null if you allow the foreign key to be null. Or you can go on delete cascade, which means if you delete the parent record, it takes the kids along for the ride. So cascade deletes. In other words, you kill the parent record and it also kills the kids. You wipe the whole family. So this slide basically covers everything you'd ever need to know for a create table. Yeah. Providence. Absolutely. I just left it as it was created for the textbook. It's just extra. You're, yeah, this is the, uh, the people that wrote the textbook had a, the following philosophy is you should define the entire thing every time. 
Uh, you know how in Java sometimes you can create a method that has optional parameters? You guys probably haven't even learned. I don't know yet. You know, you can create a function or a method that has optional parameters. But the way these guys decide to write the textbook is even optional parameters are going to be included for the ride. Um, there is some caring in the order of how you put the stuff in. For example, it's always field name, data type, and then everything else. Uh, the order after the fact here is not as important, but normally you go field name, data type, null, not null, and any constraints after that. It's just how it's usually done. Some database servers will care more than others. So it's just good to get into the habit of following that general rule. So if you remember this whole parent optional required um, one to one, one to many, it's basically saying, you know, if the parent is optional, you can allow it to be null on the foreign key. If the parent is required, it's not null. And for the one to one, it's exactly the same thing. If the parent is optional, it's null. If the parent's required, it's not null. It's, you know, so if you go back to this slide, it's saying that the artist ID here is not null and it's a foreign key. So that means that when you add a table into the work, it requires an artist ID. If we made this not nullable, as in, you know, the word not was not there, that sounded terrible, double negative. So if artist ID int null instead, you'd be able to actually add a work entry without an artist. So that's what the null and the not null does. That basically enforces the whole mandatory parent bit. And then you've got a casual relationship. Um, avoid casual relationships. And that sounds really terrible also for a different reason. Um, so basically, you create a foreign key column, but you don't create the constraint. So you basically create the, so in this slide, it would be as if we had artist ID here, but we didn't actually have the, the constraint, the rule actually being created. So that means that you could add an entry in that table and put anything you wanted in the artist ID column. Like you could put anything you wanted in there. It doesn't need to exist anywhere else. That's known as a casual relationship. Um, it is a terrible thing to do. As far as the database is concerned, casual relationships are not cool. Just don't do that. If you're going to have a foreign key, make it a foreign key. Casual relationships is just a database cancer. It's just guaranteed to cause you problems eventually. Okay, so now if we already created a table and we want to alter this table, it's, well, alter table will let you change it. You can use it to add, remove, and change columns. You can use it to add and remove constraints. The Postgres alter command, because the way they do it is they it's not a page on alter table, it's a page on alter, and it talks about all the things alter can change. Alter can change all the things. Uh, it can change tables, it can change views, it can change constraints, indexes, that database itself. Did you have a question? No, it's just a hand. Okay. Yeah, yeah, no, no. I was just sure because for a minute I thought you had a question, then you, the hand started going. So I'm like, okay, the claw. And then, so you can use it to add, remove, and change columns, constraints, and all that fun stuff. Here's a couple of quick examples. We want to add a column. So it's alter table customer. So we're going to, you know, we're playing with the customer table and we're going to add a column. You give it a name, give it the data type, and any constraints it has. If we want to drop an existing column, it's, you know, alter table, customer, drop column, whatever it is. In theory, you can go add column or just add. Um, some database servers will require you to add, to use the word add column, some won't. Uh, some are really forgiving and they'll accept it either way. The second one, on the other hand, it's always, you always have to include the, key, the keyword column. And we got one more, and then I'm going to go create some tables for you guys. Um, actually, these are the two more, I should say. This is how you add a new constraint. And that's how you drop the constraint. 
Um, normally, is you've created the table, and then you realize you needed a foreign key, and you forgot to include it as part of the create table command. Or you're adding a new table that's going to be a parent. So you need to add a new foreign key. So then you'd add the constraint after the fact. And if you want to get rid of the constraint, you can drop it. And it is easy to remove a table. Uh, be really careful because it not only drops the table, it drops the data too. Um, drop table, whatever you want to call it. In this case, the table is called trans. So drop table trans, gone. It's all gone. All the things no longer exist. You guys will learn something really quick in this course. Guess what SQL does not have? There's no undo. Well, you're running a command. Open up a DOS prompt. Go del space whatever file name and hit and don't do it. Just I thought he was actually going to do it. So you open up a command prompt. You go type in the word del space some file and hit enter. What happens? The file gets deleted. There is no undo. There's no trash can. You are modifying the data real time. So you're driving down the highway. There's no brakes. That's literally what this is, is you actually have to pay attention to what you're doing. And as a person that's been doing this for a long time, I've managed to fuck up several times. Where I've had to recover from backup because I wasn't I was I didn't have enough coffee. I, yeah, I was lucky I had a backup one of those times. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it was really bad that day. I, I just got lucky that the system backup had run like three hours earlier. So I didn't even lose any data. Because I was like at, working at like 5.30 in the morning for something. So, yeah. Um, you can rename columns as follows. If you try that command, because I can't remember if this is exactly the syntax for Postgres. Uh, that was the syntax for MySQL. I'm pretty sure it works in Postgres. If it doesn't work, go look it up. Because every database server does some of these commands a little bit different. The, the funny thing about the SQL standard, like SQL 99, is it's not, you shall write the commands this way. Is you will provide this functionality. And you should make it look in this syntax. But they then go, oh, you know, I know better than IBM, so I'm going to go do my own thing. Said the open source developer writing my SQL. <laughs> All right, so that's alter, table, rename. And if there happens to be foreign keys and you want to drop the parent table, you also got to drop the child tables. No. It won't let you. It will give you an error. I'll actually if, just remind me in a second and I will demonstrate for you guys. Exactly. That's because uh, PowerPoint really sucks at accepting pasting. No, space, it is space agnostic. Uh, it only cares about the first space it sees. It doesn't care about carriage returns, doesn't care about tabs, it couldn't give two shits. It just, as long as the keywords are separated by at least one white space. That's what it cares about. Okay. Uh, plan B is if you don't want to drop the child tables, you can drop the constraints and then drop the parent table. So, you know, if, if you can't delete the parent table because the child tables are there, you can just tell the child table the parent does not exist and then delete the parent. That's a choice you have. Um, okay, truncate. I'm going to talk in a bit. So I'm going to go do a few examples. First, just truncate is something. Uh, and not all database servers do it the same way. So that's why there's a bit of a pause there. Okay. So page admin, uh, you've all hopefully installed this. You've all discovered how terrible it is launching. Um, this is that's the thing about PG Admin 4. PG Admin 3 was actually really fast, but it doesn't work for any versions of Postgres after version 9, 
which was discontinued uh, five years ago. So we're stuck with this tool. Uh, there are other tools you can get to do most of this work. When you connect, on the left, you have a list of databases. You can explore the contents of said databases. Under the schema, you can look that there's tables and there's all your tables. Um, it'll show you the structure of the tables, the columns, constraints, um, all the fun stuff that you would normally expect to see. Um, show the foreign keys and everything's all in here. Now to run queries, you will click on the database you want to connect to. And where is it? It's this one on the left. So this is the, the one you want to use. I'm going to click on that. It's going to launch and take forever. Um, you will notice it's actually extra sluggish on my machine because while I'm screen recording for some unknown reason, it absolutely kills rendering. So it takes extra long for everything to happen. Not in this machine. This laptop, uh, it's 3.1 pounds with the brick. So I, I decided to uh, cheap out on hardware to, to not carry anything. OK, so yeah, I'm actually working with a completely blank database. So just show you guys right here, if you want to create a blank database to play with, See right where it says databases? You right click, create, database, give it a name, hit save. You don't need to change any of this other stuff unless you want to. This is, you know, table space and encoding and, you know, heavy duty, extra crap. So all you need is the name of the database. You can create your own database. So I've got an actually. My example database right now is um, has not been deflowered yet. It's about to be abused. So let me just caps lock key on. No. All right. So I did say that it's not case sensitive for the keywords. There is a convention that you normally write the SQL keywords uppercase. It's just to help with legibility. It's about that whole thing where you could technically write all your Java without any tabs. And you don't need to put spaces between any arguments. And, you know, you could write your entire program on one line if you wanted. Um, there are some co unwritten conventions for SQL that normally you do it uppercase. Um, I'm just trying to convince it to let me go bigger for the font, and it's not letting me. Uh, uh, file, preferences. Query tool, editor, font size, one. Mm. 1.2, save. There we go. That's probably big enough. People are back and read that. Okay. So I'm going to go create table, um, a parent table, because, you know, I'm just so obvious. I always make sure to close my parentheses right away before I start filling in the inside. It's just a good habit. Actually, I noticed it actually, did it actually create the, the closing one for me? Hey, this is a new feature. Yay. That It didn't used to do that. Yeah, because technically I, this is going to be a single command I'm going to run. You only use the semicolon when you're using multiple commands. All right, so create table, um, parent ID, it's an integer, integer. Uh, oh, the hell was that syntax on that slide? Hang on. Not null, generated, always as identity. Okay, so we're going to go uh, generated, always as identity, comma. You'll notice I didn't put in the not null because when I turn this into a primary key in a moment, it, the primary key can never be null. 
Therefore, it's implicit that it's going to be not null. Exactly. So the columns are all comma delimited. The columns, I'm creating multiple columns. They're the com I know. Each column is comma delimited. So no, the semicolon is the end of the command. Picture this as you know you got your method in your Java code and you separate the arguments with a comma. That is just my arguments get to hold multiple things at once. So my name is not null. Null. Um, date of birth is a date. Uh, not null. Um, I'm going to create a column called active. It's going to be a Boolean. I'm going to default to true. So it's going to be a true false column and it's going to default to true. So when I add a new record in this table, the active column will be true. So the last one I'm going to do is a constraint. Uh, we're going to call this uh, APT because I'm lazy. Primary key. And it's a primary key that goes on parent ID. You will notice that my last column does not have a comma. Do you know what? I'm going to make that font just a hair bigger. Just give me a second. Uh, editor, editor, editor. 1.3. Save. There. The joys of proportional fonts. It's, you know, it's a thing. So we have the parent column with an integer. It's going to be generated always. Name, varkar, blah, blah, blah. Date of birth. This one defaults to true. I have a constraint. I gave it a name with the primary key. And now I'm going to hit the run button and I'm going to hope I don't, I didn't make a mistake. Go. Um, and it ran successfully. You'll see a little green thing at the bottom. Now I'm going to go back to my query and I'm just going to be really nice. I'm going to go copy notepad. Where'd that go? Hello? Notepad plus plus, you're usually the world's fastest thing. No, paste. I'm going to try to remember to keep track of what I'm typing so I can just give it to you guys all as one file. I make no promises. So I go select star from a parent table. I'm going to hit run. And you will see here's the output. Realistically, I can actually put the output at the bottom normally. Um, it's not going to let me. Probably because I'm running the editing software, but the, the recording software is acting a little funny. Uh, but normally you're able to dock this at the bottom and, you know, oh, there it is right there. There. So now I can run my query and show you guys the results. So I did a select star. You will see here's the columns I created. There's no data because I just made the table. Uh, the table is empty. All right. So now I'm going to go um, create table, a child table, open and close, put in my semicolon, and I'm going to go child ID, integer, uh, generated, always as identity, not identify, identi identity. Uh, I'm going to put in my foreign key right here, so I'm going to go parent ID, it's an integer. I'm going to make the parent required because, you know, I decide I'm going to. I'm going to add, uh, I don't know, child name. It's a varkar 50 and not null. And uh, child description uh, text. And it's allowed to be null. So I'm going to create my first constraint. 
constraint uh, ACTPK. By the way, the name of these constraints can be whatever you want. Just don't put spaces in them. Like I'm just being lazy. Normally, it, I, normally the syntax I follow for this would be like the parent, the table name, PK, FK, whatever. I just don't feel like typing over and over again. So ACTPK, and it's primary key, child ID, constraint, ACTFK. Uh, oops, let's go ACTFK. Foreign key parent ID references uh, a parent table parent ID. And at this point, when you're creating your foreign key constraint, you can actually stop right there because it will default to no action. So if you want to save yourselves a little bit of typing, you don't need to put in the on, on update, uh, no action, on delete, no action. You don't need to do it if you don't want to. And let my syntax write, execute. And it says that it did it successfully. There's always a first time for everything where I manage to do both tables without a mistake. Okay, so I'm going to create a child table too, and then I'm going to forget a comma. So I'm actively forgetting a comma in here. I'm going to hit the run button. We got an error message. Syntax error at or near child description. This is not like Java that basically tells you exactly where the problem is and what the problem is. SQL goes, hey, I detected something went horribly wrong at child description. Usually that means the problem is somewhere before it. The good news is this editor is usually smart enough to detect minor mistakes. So if I were to fix it like this and then run it, oh, darn. Um, relationship ACTPK already exists. Postgres cares about the object names. It's already had a, a primary key called ACTPK. So it says, by the way, you're not allowed to do this a second time. So if you see an error message that says something already exists, guess what? You know, it's already there. Maybe you should change the name and or find out why you're trying to recreate the same thing twice. So I just fixed it. I'm going to hit run again. And it ran. Uh, all right. So oh, this is me creating the tables. I am going to uh, select star from a parent table like this one more time. Now I'm going to show you guys alter table. Uh, a parent table add column. Uh, Email varkar150. I'm going to allow the email to be null, so I'll just end it there. And I'm going to hit run. Actual fact here, I'll show you guys why you want the semicolon. I can select the whole thing and run it. So you can run multiple commands at once as long as you remember your semicolons. So if we look at the messages, uh, you'll notice it only ever tells you about the last one. And I've been forgetting to, to include all my commands. It's a good thing this tool has a query history. Uh, you can actually copy to the editor right here. So you can grab the stuff as you go. So I am going to grab this example, just copy, uh, pop that in Notepad++. Um, Grab this one, copy, pop into Notepad++. Grab this one, copy. It's a really handy tool for your labs. Just, just putting out hints and tips there. 
So because when you're submitting your tet labs, you're going to be submitting them as text files. So there it is. All right, so here's our, uh, so far I added a new column. I am going to deviate from the lecture at this point, and I'm going to actually show you guys some of the DDL stuff so that you guys can see what happens when you're you're adding columns and updating columns and that kind of stuff. So, so far you guys have seen the slides for creating, altering, and deleting a table. When you want to add data to a database, the command is insert, not add. Often I get students say, well, then why didn't they call it add? They were trying to follow the logic of a filing cabinet. Well, they were working with managers, right? So when you go to put something in a filing cabinet, what do you do? You insert it into the folder. There it is, insert into a parent table. You will list out the columns you're inserting into. Uh, which I do not remember what they are. Refresh. A parent table. So you will notice that I'm going to skip the primary key because I made it be a uh, surrogate key that auto increments. If it's an auto incrementing primary key, primary key do not include it because you're going to break your database. You're not going to break the database itself. You're going to break your data. So if it's an auto-incrementing primary key, don't include it. So I'm going to start with name, date of birth. Um, I'm going to skip active because I gave it a default value, and I'm going to include email. Now I'm going to insert values. Single quotes. MySQL allows you to use double quotes. Postgres uses double quotes as object identifiers. Single quotes works everywhere. So use single quotes for your strings. Um, I, I know in Java, single quotes and double quotes have different meaning. I couldn't tell you what the difference is, but I know there's a difference. I know there's a difference in C sharp, there's a difference in C++. Uh, in this, just use single quotes, they're literal strings. All right, so I got my date of birth. So uh, 1975, and I really fucked that up. Hang on. Comma. 1975-0307. And email address will be um, bill at bob.com. And I'm going to slap a semicolon on there, and I'm going to hit run. It says inserted. One. Magic. Okay. Now I'm going to show you guys some common error messages that you may experience. Actually, first things first, let me go do a from a parent table. I'm going to go select that. You can run cho to choose to just run the one command by highlighting it. Hit the run button. And here's my data I just added. Notice here's the parent ID, which was auto incrementing. So it gave it value one because I just created the table. That's my surrogate key. It is automatically generated. Active is set to true because I defaulted it to true. So here's another thing. I'm going to go and hit uh, run, 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 run. Oh, it's trying to catch up. There you go. You can run the same thing over and over and over again. And what are you going to get? The same data over and over and over again. But you can notice here that I have my auto-incrementing primary key is working. All right, so now to highlight some common errors you may get. And I'm going to run this command and get an error message just for you guys. Insert has more target columns than expressions. I specified that I'm inserting into three columns. I gave it two values. So when you guys are doing inserts, you see a thing about, you know, mismatch number of, or the other thing it could go with is the other way around, which I run that one too. And it's going to say, has more expressions than target columns. So when you see those kinds of errors, it means that you don't have the same number of columns defined as what you're trying to put in, in one direction or the other. All right, now to go back to this. So I said that, the name was mandatory, 
But I'm going to take out the name because I made the name not null. And I'm going to run this command and go. Null value in column name of relation violates not null constraint. That means you're trying to insert into something that is marked as not null and you did not include the value. These are the top three errors you're going to get when you're doing your when you're learning how to do this. There is one other one. No, 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 no. Okay, I'm going to undo this. The good news is there is undo in the editor. It's just not undo the database. Is the remember name is a character field, right? What am I trying to put into there? And we're going to hit run. Let's go see if it actually coerces it or not. Yes. Well, that was made a liar out of me. Um, it's actually supposed to give you an error. <laughs> um, okay, what we can do, let's go the other way around. Uh, let's add the word active. Uh, the other thing you'll notice that the order of the columns here doesn't have to match the order of the columns in the table. It, you just As long as your data lines up with what you've been defined, you can put it in any order you want. I am going to try to put in uh, yeah, single quotes. Okay, I'm going to try to shove in a string into my Boolean. Let's go see if that works. There we go. I got an error message. Invalid input syntax or type Boolean. I tried to put something into it that wasn't a Boolean. If you have an integer and you try to put in a string, guess what it's going to say? You're trying to put a string into an integer. What it, the only reason why it allowed the integer to go into the string is because it was able to coerce it. Yeah, it's assuming it's type. In other words, it says, hey, this is a string. Did they give anything weird in this? No. I can make this a string. It's actually really bad form to do that. You should never coerce the database. Um, why? Because you can have unexpected results. That's why. So I'm going to go select star from this, and I'm going to hit run. And you will see, here's the one that I coerced at the bottom. Right here. Good times. OK, so that's our insert statement. Um, I'm literally almost skipping the rest of the slides. I'm just going to go back to the slides at the end and make sure I didn't miss anything important. So now the next one is I want to update. And this is another spot where you guys are going to realize that whoever designed the SQL language, they basically put a bunch of pocket protectors in different rooms and told them you're not allowed to talk to the other guy while you come up with the command. So the insert command, the update command, and the delete commands all look different. That is literally the hardest part about learning SQL is realizing that there's all this different little syntax. So now I'm going to do update a parent table set name equal to bill. Hello. Bang. Now, this is actually a very dangerous command. Yes. That's what I was about to talk about. This is a dangerous command. I will run it just for shits and giggles, just to show you guys. Okay. Select star from a parent table. If I run this and I hit go, it'll go update 12. It updated 12 rows. Let's just say you weren't planning to update more than one row and you see a bigger number than one here. You just are having a bad day now. Because guess what I can't do? I can't reverse it. It's done. And how fast did that run? 163 milliseconds on this underpowered laptop that is currently running screen record software. Um, our primary Postgres instance in Amazon, because ours is set in Amazon, uh, that command would have probably run in about 16 milliseconds. Like there is no time for you to recover if you screw up. It's just life. OK, so here's our query. What we should have done, and we'll be talking more about this next week. It's a bit of chicken before the egg thing where, you know, you, there's all these little bits you need to learn. And 
there's not a good order to learn any of it in, is where id is equal to 1. Um, and I'm going to change this one to Ann. Uh, okay, Anna instead. And hit go. Uh, ID doesn't exist. I'm so used to working with the database at work. Like this. Go. Update one. If I were to do my select star and I hit go, you will notice something a little weird. Do you notice the first row is now two? Because one's now at the bottom. This is a Postgres thing. Not all database servers do this. So Postgres has a really interesting way of updating data in the database. What it does is it goes, oh, I'm updating a record. Database, we're going to add the new record. We're going to ignore the primary key. Did it get added successfully? Yes. Now we're going to delete the original record. It does a very conservative write process. Um, MySQL, it just goes, duh. And it just changes it. Like, it doesn't care. Um, I'm not a fan of MySQL, as you've noticed. Um, MySQL is definitely not a good product. It has lots of problems. Um, so this is how you update. And I am going to do, um, and if you want to update multiples, you just change the where clause. If you don't include the where clause, you're updating everything. It's not great. Um, oh, yeah, I keep meaning to include some of these commands along for the ride in my notepad. Like this. Um, all right, so I am going to actually insert into a child table. I want to show you guys one last error message that's kind of important. So, again, I'm going to ignore the child ID. I'm going to include the parent ID, the child name, and if I remember, the description is optional, so I'm not going to include that because I don't feel like typing. Values, parent ID 1, child name is, I don't know, Jane. Okay, I'm going to run this. Yay, it ran, no error messages, congratulations. Here's a few things about the fact that I made this a not null foreign key. The first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna try type in ID one, I don't know, 100,000. And I'm gonna run this. So I'm just showing you guys error messages now. Bam, insert update on table, a child table violates foreign key constraint. Parent key ID 100,000 is not present in the table. It's literally telling you, hey, by the way, you just tried to add a record with a foreign key for a value that doesn't exist in the parent. Because the point of having a foreign key is that the values are controlled by a parent table. So that's error message number one. So that basically means that whatever you put into here is invalid. Like I can do this and put three in here and it'll work a treat. Insert. But if I try to put something in there that doesn't exist, it's not going to be happy. And at the, by the same token, I'm going to take up the parent ID to show you guys the other error message. I'm going to hit go. And it's going to say null value in column parent ID violates not null constraint. It's saying, hey, you just tried to add something in the foreign key. You tried to just add a record without specifying the foreign key. That's what this is saying. So these are your more common error messages you will experience while doing the insert, the update, and delete. Yes. <clears throat> You'd have to include it for every time you insert. So no, no, you have to define it as a surrogate key. Like you have to define it as an auto incrementing key. If you don't tell it's auto incrementing, it's going to expect you to feed it values. Yeah, if you don't tell it how to generate it, it's going to expect that you're going to tell it how to what the value is. Either you tell it you can do this for me, or I will always do it. Those are the two modes you. Have. All right. So now I'm going to go back to um, my parent table here. I'm going to go delete from a parent 
table where id is equal to 2. I'm just dodging that one. Um, because what will happen if I say delete from a parent table and I don't include the where clause? It's going to nuke all the things, maybe. In this case, it wouldn't nuke all the things because there's, chi there's children involved. Yeah, so I'm going to actually show you guys all these different error messages as we go. So hit go. Now, if I were to do a, uh, well, it's not that. That's because I'm, I keep mistyping my column name. Let's try that again. Bang, gone. That one didn't have a child. So I'm allowed to kill the parent because there's no kids. Now I'm going to try to delete. Absolutely. I love that. I've actually had comments on my YouTube channel from people saying, that's some very terrible things they're saying in your class. I'm like, but you know what? Every single student that's ever had me will always remember these, these things. Because they go dance with some really terrible things in class. So I'm going to try to delete one that has a child. It's going update or delete on table parent violates foreign key constraint. Key is still referenced from the child table. It's basically saying, hey, you're not allowed to delete this. So now I'm going to turn around and just take off the where clause. And again, it's not going to let me because there's child records. So if I go select star from a parent parent table and hit go, you'll see that everything's still there because Postgres is actually smart enough to say, hey, something went wrong when I was trying to do this delete command, so let's roll it back. So if an error happens, Postgres is able to undo itself. You just don't get to undo. MySQL, 50-50 chance. Uh, depending on how you define the table, it may or may not work. So not a fan of that either. So So if I were to go uh, delete, oh, actually, the slide we left on was called truncate. Truncate is a very simple command. And it's a very fast command. And I'm just going to run it. And it's just a trunky table. Doesn't even tell you what happened. Truncate literally tells the database server, see this table here? There's no data here anymore. It doesn't do a delete, because the delete will do row one delete, row two delete, row three delete. Truncate says, hey, table, you have zero rows. It doesn't even delete the data. It's still on the disk. It's just the whole table is marked as empty. You had a question? There was a question. No, he's good. You got a question? Hey? No. Oh, the, the, I, just, I just killed the kids. They're gone. The table's still there. If we were to drop the table, then it drops the table. So I'm going to put some stuff back in here. So I'm, actually, I got to go grab some. Uh, hang on. Um, I, actually, I forgot to copy this. I forgot to include it in my history here for you guys. Like that. And then I try to delete um, some of this stuff. Like that. All right. So. I'm going to put in the uh, the some child records again. And I'm going to go, 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 go. Okay, I just put in a bunch of kids. They're all related to the same person. Um, cool. Now, so, so far you see me insert, update, and delete. That's the common DML, uh, DDL for, add, for manipulating the data. Truncate is somewhere between DDL and DML. Depending on what database server you're working on, truncate does extra things. In Postgres, it just truncates the table. Um, and take it as someone who's done it by accident once, uh, truncate's really fast. Uh, I accidentally truncated a 3 million row table and it took about uh, 100 milliseconds. Like by the time I, I didn't even have time to realize I screwed up by the time I saw that I screwed up. Um, so 
be very careful with truncate. It's not a command you use regularly. Normally it's used for um, uh, when you're importing data because you're going to bring tape you're bring table data into a table temporarily and you want to make sure it's clear so you truncate it that's pretty much the only time you use truncate uh there is really no use for truncate except for that or um you're trying to purge a table because it's um a generated table where you're constantly putting in data that never changes so you know every night you update the sales numbers so you truncate it because you want that data to be fresh it's the only time you truncate um in MySQL, truncate also resets the auto increment. So in Postgres, even though I truncated the table, if I were to go, like this, you'll notice the ID started at five, even though I truncated the table. Postgres, the truncate does not reset the surrogate key. In MySQL, it resets the surrogate key. It depends on the server, yes. You could theoretically reinsert four without damaging anything. Uh, sure. I don't know why they chose. It's a design decision. I think the decision why it does it that way is because that's how Oracle does it. And Postgres is known for being like 95% Oracle compatible. So they try to do a lot of their stuff the same way Oracle does it so that they can steal Oracle's clients because it's free. So, you know, just come to us. Um, yeah. So now I'm going to do is drop table. So I'm going to go drop table, a parent table. Remember, we have um, foreign keys. I'm going to go run. It's go, cannot drop table, a parent table because other objects depend on it. You can't nuke a parent table unless you get rid of the child tables first. So you would have to go drop table, a child table, gonna hit go. The good news is you will notice that it, it tells you which table it is that's depending. So you can just keep doing this until you manage to get all the children. Then you go go, and now everything's gone. My database is empty. If I hit refresh here, there are no tables left. I just wiped out my database. Um, which is cool because it gets me ready for the next class. Um, I am just going to go back into my query history really quick to um, include this for you guys. Okay, let's go see how many slides I missed. Or didn't miss. Uh, you guys will notice that I will be. Oh, hang on. I go back to where I was. There's truncate. Okay. Um, you'll notice that while I'm doing the SQL, that I'll do a lot of that where I just sit down and go through everything that's supposed to be covered that day and then jump through the slides really quick to make sure I'm not forgetting anything. I've learned historically that students learn a lot better when I'm typing and making mistakes because it gives you guys a chance to actually see what the errors are than just going through the slides and then saying, go figure it out in lab. Um, so that's truncate and see that last line reset surrogate key value to the initial value. That's for my SQL, not for Postgres. So that's, you know, take it, take that one to the grain of salt. Um, index we're going to talk about at the end of the term. Like we actually have like several slides just on indexes. So we'll talk about creating indexes later. Uh, I meant to actually take that slide out. Well, here's insert. I did that. Here's update. Also did that. Uh, bulk update, also known as an update without a where clause. And it says, be careful. If you execute the above statement, you'll change every row because you're not filtering it. I'll be teaching you guys about basic filtering next week. So um, update, you know, you can choose to update a bunch of different customers. By not specifying the primary key, you could specify something else. Again, I'll be talking about that stuff next week. Um, that is too complicated for now. And I, I can guarantee that's not gonna be on the exam. That's actually a really complicated update statement. Uh, delete, 
Okay, I showed you guys that. And um, yeah, I actually didn't miss anything. I actually covered it with better examples than what this had. So I'm going to talk about assignment two really quick. You now have everything you need for part one of assignment two. Today's slides covered part one, actually part one and part two of assignment two. So literally in this today's lecture alone, you covered 50% of the second assignment. Um, I usually recommend that the essay assignment has not been published yet. I don't think it has. You should start thinking about your teammates sooner than later. Um, because what it is, is you're actually going to be given a database diagram and you're going to create the scripts, to create, populate, and query it. Yeah. Everybody has the same diagram in this case. Um, same thing. Same. Yeah, same. Same format. So, yeah. So, that's what I'm going to be doing going forward is SQL, typing it in here, doing over some of the basics. Maybe I'll be doing like a bunch of slides, like a bunch of concepts, go back to the slides for a bit, then a bunch of concepts, back to the slides for a bit. Uh, you'll also notice that most of the lectures will be a little bit shorter than what it was like in the first half. Um, because realistically, the, the SQL is not that complicated. It's just learning the syntax is what's painful uh, for most people. And again, I really recommend that Postgres tutorial. It's a fantastic place to learn the stuff I don't cover in detail in class. Um, like when I went through school, I had SQL for four hours a week for an entire semester, just SQL, not database design. I, there's a lot more to it than what we're going to be covering in this class. So if you want to expand your knowledge a little bit, the tutorial is a really good place to go. It's got Postgres has some really nifty functionality. Uh, if you care about data, if you don't care about data, well, whatever. It is what it is. Yeah. There it is. It's in the slides. PostgreSQLTutorial.com. Um, actually, I'll just I'll pull it up for you guys just so you can see what it looks like. Um, soon. I I prefer to release it fairly early, so you guys have more time to do it. So that's what the tutorial site looks like. Um. It's got the good old getting started stuff. And it includes, you know, in this case, here's the select statement kind of stuff. Um, you'll also have, um, here's insert, shows you how to do the inserts, you know, all the fun stuff. The tutorial doesn't use the, uh, it uses serial data type instead of the auto-generated thing that I used, but they do the same thing. Serial is just the old way of writing it. Um, you'll have create table and all that fun stuff's all in here too. So the tutorial is well worth looking at if you're not sure how to do something. Outside of that, um, and I'm not making, I'm, I'm not even, I'm not showing you. Yes, the good old AI helpers. Um, that's the one that's built into Edge. It's Bing. It's not Bing anymore. It's Copilot. Uh, as you can see, I got the update, uh, the preview version, which is also on the desktop. And it gives you like a really good detailed answer on how to do it. Um, I mean, that's... That's better than the textbooks. But you know why I like Bing's compared to ChatGPT? It includes references. Where it got and look, look where it got its reference from. <laughs> so there's a reason I recommend that website to you guys. Um yeah, so 
two really good tools. I'm not against using AI to learn. I'm just against people using AI to do the work for them. There's there's a difference. AI has its place, and it's really not good actually doing work for you. It's good at explaining things to you. Okay, so outside of that, uh, that's it, folks. Look at that, an hour, 20 minutes.